Europe, good morning from sunny Bratislava. And to our friends in the land of the rising sun in Japan, konbawa. I'm Roger Hilton, Defense and Security Fellow at GlobeSec, and it is my pleasure to moderate today's session in cooperation with the Sasakawa Peace Foundation on Exiting Normal, Emerging Disruptive Technologies and Their Impact on Military Operations and Equipment. Before getting started, I want to give a warm welcome to our fantastic list of speakers, both here in Europe and in Japan. I'd like to introduce everybody first to Dr. Stella Adorf, NATO International Civilian, Head of Situational Awareness at the NATO Headquarters Situation Center. Anna Nack, Deputy Lead of the Technology Disruption Uncertainty Research Workstream at RAND Europe. Bonji Ohara, Senior Fellow at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. And Colonel Mashasiro Shitsu, Chief Director, Innovation Driving Office for Emerging Technology, Japan Air Self Defense Force, Air Staff Office. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. Before starting, we have a few housekeeping items to go through with the audience. These discussions will be held simultaneously in both English and Japanese, so make sure you're on the right channel if you're following us on Zoom and Facebook. To make life easier for our viewers and for our amazing translators working behind the scenes today, we will conduct the discussions in language blocks, so comments from our speakers will be grouped together to make it easier to follow. When it comes to the Q&A, we reserve some time towards the end of the session, so feel free to drop your questions in the chat bar on Zoom or in the comment section on Facebook. Threats to the international security environment have never been faster to materialize. In addition to the current great power dynamic, quantum leaps in technological development and ultra connectivity are transforming how nations assess security threats, as well as how they engage with the private sector stakeholders. From hypersonic systems to the integration of machine human teaming on the battlefield, the pages of science fiction are very much here already. Against the backdrop of an ongoing struggle for domination in the fields of innovation, breakthrough capabilities, as well as research and development of critical future technologies, the stakes for democracies have never been higher. And consequently, this conversation could not be more timely. So once again, let's exit normal and everybody let's have a great conversation. So Stella, let's start with you. In the recent time, NATO has come out with some, some very interesting reports like the EDT Advisory Committee report, as well as the Science and Technology Office's Science and Technology Trends from 2020 and 2040. Even more recently, the Alliance has addressed some of these emerging technology issues in the recent Brussels Summit Communique. So Stella, let's get us started here. Based on these reports and the various declarations from NATO, can you tell us what the Alliance considers some of the emerging technologies that hold the greatest potential to be game changers on operations in the theater? Thank you so much, Roger, and uh, good morning to everyone. It's a real great pleasure to have the opportunity to speak here to such a big audience and also, of course, um, along such great panelists. And just a short disclaimer, of course, everything I say is my personal assessment and, and opinion and not necessarily um, constituting official NATO policy or a stance. Um, I think when, thank you very much for mentioning these reports already, um, um, Roger. I think a lot of things have moved along lately and uh, I would like to highlight a few things that are also part of these reports and um, part of the considerations in the Alliance. And I think um, the first thing is when we talk about game changers or technology as game changers, um, impo it's important to understand the game. And I believe that this game of war, um, to use a euphemism, has and will further change. Um, the future operating environment will be determined across physical and non-physical domains, which will challenge state actors and international organizations and, of course, alliances as well in their thinking and their strategy, how to use military and non-military instruments of power. I think both the future defense and deterrence will very much depend on answering the questions about what or who needs to be defended. So is it like territories? Is it infrastructure, our way of life? Is it data or privacy? and who to deter. So that means like who will have access to weapons that can reach us and what will these weapons look like and how can we counter them? So I think this game will be a very um, crowded field of players and it will be much dominated by other actors uh, than states or state entities. 
And in particular, non-state actors, as we see them already now playing a huge role in our for security, um, they will have a they will have act much more freely and unpredictably than um, state actors can, who will still remain also in the future, I think, at various degrees accountable and liable towards um, constituencies and, and the public. And I think this is where the new technologies come into play. So there have always been new technologies playing a huge uh, role for war and the face of shaping the face of war. But I think what is new now is that um, the coming technologies are being developed from the bottom up and with an extremely short time from development to market. So it means they emerge fast. They sometimes take huge leaps forward in their development, as we've seen, for example, during the COVID pandemic. And they can also become disruptive in a way that they challenge us across various domains and how we operate in them. Uh, they also often have a dual use. That means they can become relevant to millions of civilian consumers worldwide, but they can also be weaponizable and uh, security, be security relevant. Um, I think any kind of future, especially military technologies, will be highly intelligent. They will be digital in nature. They will be interconnected, and they will, they will be distributed entirely different to what we know so far. Um, so for the alliance, that means in particular that it's important to see why these emerging disruptive technologies are important for our activities, how they can be expected to develop, and what the impact will be from like an operational and organizational and also a enterprise state uh, standpoint. Um, for organizations like NATO, uh, you know, organizations of like-minded countries, I think it will be important to determine which is the baseline that nations agree on. And how will we align our activities, our capabilities, and our efforts for deterrence and defense in such a new operating environment along our three core tasks? And um, the choice of priorities regarding EDTs might have far reaching consequences way beyond the military area. And it's important to notice uh, that um, the NATO Science and Technology, Technology Organization, the STO, which is a network of 6,000 allied and partner scientists, have come up with some recommendations that were then picked up by the NATO Advisory Group uh, on emerging disruptive technologies. And they have made several recommendations that go beyond just the technical realm. They really also think of societal contexts which in within which these uh, technologies exist and how NATO might maintain relevance and pace within this environment. And I just want to mention the five key areas or domains that have been um, mentioned with high priority, which is advances in machine learning and AI, the harnessing the quantum scale, data security, computing, enabled hardware and biological and synthetic materials. And I would like to just end my statement with just one point or one highlight on um, the question of data and big data, because that's the one where I'm involved in my work as well. So obviously it's all about how we can um, use advanced analytical methods to make sense of and visualize large volumes of data. And that has several applications for NATO and for the military in, in, in general, like our training and readiness, our logistics, our ISR, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, but also of course, situation awareness, the field that I work in. And in my team, for example, we have um, data scientists who are involved in big data projects and they identify the best approach for the Alliance to ensure access to big data. And of course, also its applicability. And we started looking into this really, for example, during the COVID pandemic, where we analyzed the impact of the pandemic developments on various domains relevant to the Alliance and to security overall in the Euro-Atlantic area. So I don't want to take more time away from the other speakers, but that's a little bit of a sum up of, uh, of some NATO views. Thank you. For, for those just joining us, uh, Dr. Stella Adorf, just recap a little bit of some of the main findings from NATO. Stella, I'm so happy, and I think I speak for everybody on the webinar, that it was great that you defined the parameters of what the game is, what we're facing. A great sort of point to lead off with when you're talking about equipment, especially sort of the condensed time frame when it goes to development and hitting the market in terms of applicability. And then obviously the dual use application of these technologies uh, is hypersensitive and it's, it's applied everywhere across societal domains, as you said. So great that the Alliance is recognizing it. Now, Anna, we're moving on to you over here, shifting to an IO perception. Like you, Rand has been busy at work coming up with some very interesting reports. Uh, I had a chance to read the recent Innovative Technologies Shaping the 2040 Battlefield Report for the European Parliament. So given what Stella's already said, Anna, from your professional opinion, do you see, what do you see as the greatest potential for technologies as game changers? Or like Stella, do you think it's a combination of them working together? I think it's 
Definitely both of those things. And a lot of what Dr. Adorf has said has definitely, definitely resonates with a lot of the research findings in our research. So one of the projects that I work on is uh, on technology horizon scanning for the UK Ministry of Defense's Defense Science and Technology Laboratory. And we look at all across uh, all science and technology areas. And although I'm not necessarily a technical expert, what I specialize in is uh, basically explaining the so what for defense. And as you said, one of uh, the research projects that we've been working on is on the 2040 battlefield for the European Parliament as well. And that particular report focused on uh, a few of those emerging technology areas since it simply wouldn't be possible to discuss all of them today. Uh, but one of them is artificial intelligence, machine learning and big data. We're seeing increasing maturity of AI and ML systems that are able to address ambiguous and complex situations. So they're able to understand their environment and make their own decisions. Um, whereas before they used to be quite rudimentary as in they, they were able to make decisions, but still relied quite heavily on the human operator. Nowadays, they're becoming more complex, more sophisticated. Recording in progress. Um, and that provides opportunities to gain strategic advantage through information control, data access management, uh, potentially increasing the speed of decision-making processes on the battlefield uh, and increasing the stealth and rapid analysis capabilities for defensive systems as well. Um, at the same time, that could also lead to uh, kind of increased challenges of attack, attack attribution um, and AI-enabled cyber attacks. We also focused on advanced robotics and autonomous systems, which is really interesting for defense clients because they, in a lot of ways, remove human operators away from harm, uh, which uh, then opens up resources to divest uh, very critical um, human resources to other parts of um, you know, military activities that could produce strategic advantage. Uh, we're seeing advances in propuls propulsion, precision takeoff and landing, navigation and remote and autonomous systems, um, unmanned aerial vehicles that can go further afield. So if you're doing search and rescue missions or even humanitarian support, um, the power systems these days are, are enabling them to go further afield without needing to constantly go back to refuel. Uh, that means fewer trips, that means cost efficiencies, um, that also means more information and more intelligence for, for um, the military. Um, there's also increased mission flexibility. It could enable precision strike. Um, the more intelligent these systems become, that could reduce risk of collateral damage, which is, of course, always uh, an important concern. Um, but at the same time, they're also cheaper, so they're more accessible to everyone, including adversaries, even even the public. Most, I think, you know, when I started in this area, UAVs used to be, you know, prohibitively expensive. Nowadays, you can get a 200 pound one or a 200 euro one um, online, and and you know, it's even though it won't be as as sophisticated as military grade capabilities, there's a lot you can do uh, with, you know, a, quite a simple device. Um, and that also increases incentives for escalatory dynamics through uh, reduced risk to human life on the battlefield because, um, you know, if the cost is not so high, then, you know, what's the disincentive from, from applying these technologies? Um, Another area that we were looking at is biotechnology, which, you know, that, that covers quite a broad range. But for us, that means, you know, like technologies that leverage biological systems or innovations in biological sciences to develop systems with advanced properties um, and levels of performance. Uh, you know, we're seeing novel biological systems like genetically engineered bacteria that could constitute uh, constitute biological threats. Um, we're seeing in the medical field a lot of positive developments in, in terms of medical treatments, um, but also cognitive and physical enhancement. So we did a recent study for uh, UK Army HQ and Strategic Command 
on army pharmacology, for example, which covered uh, ways that you could use pharmacology to enhance the speed, endurance, um, strength, ultimately the survivability of the warfighter. Um, but that also raises a lot of, you know, interesting questions about, you know, the ethics, uh, consent, um, what it means when you reintegrate people who have had some some kind of alteration, like a permanent alteration to their systems that gives them an advantage in society for, let's say, athletes for jobs or um, in terms of, you know, the way that they could hurt other people or if it's changing the way that they cognitively function, how it affects their decision-making abilities or even, you know, morals um, once they, they're integrated back into society. Um, we had one technology area that focuses on technologies for the delivery of novel effects. So that includes weapons and subsystems that enable the delivery of um, conventional effects, but in novel ways. So we're talking about, you know, hypersonics, directed energy weapons, electronic warfare capabilities, sonic and acoustic weapons. Um, and this is probably the area that based on our research, the stakeholders that we engaged with were most concerned about and, and felt that um, uh, potentially have the most uh, potential to um, <laughs> generate operational advantage. So like hypersonic weapons that are able to achieve flights at speed of Mach 5 and above and enable your know, first strike um, and long range capabilities. Um, and conscious of time, I'm going to rattle on. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I mean, Anna, we could, we could probably just go on with all of it. Um, yeah. Just for our speakers, I think a couple of points I want to flesh out right now, just so that I think it's so great that you sort of, we introduced the idea very early on about uh, machine learning systems and all the ethical implications that come with it. Um, I referenced it very briefly in my introduction, but this idea of this hyper-connectivity uh, and the use of data and how on the battlefield, uh, you know, real-time decision-making of data coming back and forth and also in the dark in making, you know, some of these concepts are really on the rise now, like mosaic warfare or uh, command and control joint alt domain uh, pushed forward by DARPA and the Pentagon. I think for everybody out there, that's really the future that, you know, one of the greatest weapons militaries and allies are going to have is sort of the use and execution of the data we have, which is still, I think, a work in progress, but certainly the wave of the future. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing your drone collection. Um, and I think, as you said, uh, whether it's ISIS or other actors in Ukraine, you can scale these technologies up very quickly and turn a, a civilian technology into something very lethal. Uh, you see lots of sort of these drone swarms being tested with Iran as well. So like I said, the accessibility and the cost are excellent. Uh, and then obviously when it comes to biotechnology, uh, it's a bit science fiction as well with cyborgs. But I mean, it's important to recognize that just as you're mentioning the survivability of soldiers, now with climate change going on, all of these things about the breathability or the survivability of a forest fire or somebody you know, working on floods is also super important, but I think we'll have to come back to the ethical side. So shifting, and thanks for your contributions, Anna. So shifting now to the to the Asian continent, uh, Karno Shinsu, a lot has been going on in your region. Um, it's not, it's, uh, it's, things are definitely heating up. For all of our viewers out there in Europe, just a couple of quick facts. In July of 2021, the official Defense of Japan 2021 strategy was released, uh, which sort of put forward modern technologies and multi-domain self-defense forces with a high emphasis on capabilities in electromagnetic spectrum domain. Um, the famous Quad meeting um, with India, Australia, Japan, and the United States had their first major summit in March of 2021. Uh, and just recently in June and July of 2021, Japan and the United States held their largest exercise earlier. So Colonel Shinzu, we're going to head to you now. Um, from your professional, uh, professional perspective, what do you think are the breakthrough technologies and capabilities that Japan needs now and well into the future? Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger, for that introduction. First and foremost, I would like to thank all the participants from the European side. Good morning to you. And also to those of you joining us from Japan, I'll say good day. My name is Shizu. I'm with the Air Self-Defense Force. Today, I'm very happy to be joining with the GlobSec and the Hasuga Peace Foundation joint 
uh, symposium. I'm very happy. And thank you for this opportunity. I really am very appreciative for this opportunity. As was already asked by Roger already, the topic at hand is Emerging Disruptive Technologies, or EDT. Emerging Disruptive Technologies and their impact on military operations and equipment. With, the, with, the, with regard to this topic, as far as the Air Self Defense Forces, we are indeed faced with this and we're addressing this as we speak. Now, today I'm looking forward to our discussion. I've been looking forward to our discussion. But please bear in mind that any views that I express will be of my own and do not express the official views of the Air Self Defense Force. The, pure, uh, the views are purely my own. Please bear that in mind. Now, let me go back to the question on hand. What about the regional situation right now? When we take at the security environment surrounding Asia, as you're well aware, is very complicated and also undergoing a very major change, very rapid change as we speak. From the global perspective, yes, there are a lot of trends taking place, but in particular, we focus on Asia and the, and the environment surrounding Japan, there are a lot of uncertainties and that uncertainty is on the rise. That is the recognition on the part of us practitioners. Now, in terms of the political sense and in terms of the policy context, yes, over the past year or two, there has been a lot of movement. And also the topic on hand, which is technology. If we take a look at the technology perspective, indeed, we are faced with many issues that, we, that really we need to consider very seriously. And I'm looking forward to our discussion, although time is limited, I'm looking forward to exchange views with you. And I do hope that we'll be able to make discussions on a higher plane going forward. Now, I have received several questions. I, I don't know how, where I should start, but in the interest of time, let me focus on some of the elements, if I may, and share with you my views on some of the points. So first, you talked about the Quad and the policy context. You mentioned that Asia is uh, really attracting attention from the policy perspective, as is covered by the media report. The, the, the British carrier is now here in Japan. And in, ter in terms of the policy context, in terms of the technology concept, B-35 carriers are now in the waters near Japan. Now, against the backdrop, uh, practitioners like ourselves, what, what, what type of technology should we focus on? And also, how do we add capabilities that can have a general purpose? That represents a major challenge. Of course, one major element behind this challenge is that we have resources that are very finite. We only have finite resources. Human resources, physical resources, and also phys financial resources are very limited. And there are uncertainties, in, are uncertainties in all of these elements. And that is the age that we live in today. Earlier, Anna and Dr. Adolf talked about technology in their respective comments. With regard to respective technologies that they both these two speakers mentioned, these are technologies that we are either committed to or take interest in on the part of Air Self Defense Force, AI, UAV, and of course, and the super and hypersonic technologies, and also network technology inclusive of 5G. Yes, they are now described as advanced technologies or emerging ADT, but if we miss the bus, if we miss the bus, then the foundation technology, these are technologies that can eventually become foundation technologies, basic technologies going forward. So if we miss the bus, then we will actually have stepped back from the baseline and we are going to be behind in any technological competition going forward. So these emerging technologies and of course, this also applies to quantum technology and also other advancing, advanced and sensing technologies. These are areas that we are very much interested in right now. So how do we capture these technologies early on? And how do we incorporate, incorporate them into our base, basic technology? That is something that we're trying to address right now. Also, there, there was reference to the Quad earlier on. In terms of the political context, yes, these four countries are now strengthening their collaboration. But having said that, if, if we focus on the ADT today, and I'm sure I'll talk about this later on, in terms of technology as well, these quad and international cooperation is going to be indispensable. It's going to be a very uh, imperative element. So as Sam has admitted, I will end my initial comments at this juncture. I'm looking forward to our discussions later on for the details. Thank you, Roger. That is all. Uh, Colonel Shinsu, thank you so much for your input on the uh, MOD side. It goes without saying that um, your your declaration about sort of matching scalable technologies with resources, which matches 
financial resources, manpower, and what's also digestible to the public is a very hard needle to thread for everyone. It's a struggle from everybody in Canada to here in Europe and from any NATO allies. So I think uh, it's a work in progress, but given the situation going on in your region and some of the other external pressures, it's something that needs to be prioritized more. Now, not to be forgotten, Mr. O'Hara, we saved the best for last, of course. And again, thank you for working with us today, Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Mr. O'Hara, you have previous experience in the private sector, in the intelligence world, and now in the think world, meaning you have an, uh, an unbelievably unique profile to be addressing these questions. So as we, round, as we end off our first round of questions, would you like to comment on which emerging technologies or the one technology is the true game changer on operations and in theater for Japan or in the region generally? Thank you very much. I am Ohara. I am with the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. First of all, in order to have a discussion on that topic, first of all, I would like to emphasize that Japan and Europe and other countries, likewise, they don't want to engage in wars uh, voluntarily. However, in order to defend their countries, we need to understand the trends of military operations and military situations in the world and equip ourselves with military capabilities accordingly. For instance, that China, US, and Russia are studying war fighting scenarios in which emerging and distru uh, disruptive technologies are actively utilized in trying to build weapon systems necessary for such wars and joint operation is being considered. So against this backdrop, uh, we have to do our part as well. We are living in such a world age. I am not expert in China, but I would like to consider what the future that China uh, envisages and how the uh, war fighting scenarios will be changed in the future. Now, regarding China, so far, informatization has been promoted by China. So uh, they are using the ICT technologies and the C2 is to be developed and improved. And also they introduce weapons and equipments that fully leverage ICT technologies. And this is quite similar to network centric warfare embraced by the US in terms of a concept. And beyond that, there is a uh, AI enabled intelligence intelligentization uh, warfare. Concerning these developments, the technologies to be core in the future will be AI in my view. Not only AI or AI alone will not change uh, war fighting scenarios or the operations. Therefore, in accompanying the AI, necessary network uh, technology, 5G, beyond 5G, 6G technologies would be necessary. By using these technologies, if you want to do something, robotics will be necessary as well. So such uh, various technologies will be combined, which will change the uh, war fighting scenarios. However, at the center of it is there is a, a AI. Now that China, in order to maximize the benefit from intelligentization, uh, they are going to uh, use uh, robotics and AI enabled uh, warfare. And also uh, they are uh, coming up with a new war fighting tactics and operations uh, commands. So in terms of the war fighting, uh, centering around AI, we will be moving from the network centric uh, war fighting to algorithm centric warfare that is being considered in China. This is quite ambitious. Uh, furthermore, by using such AI technologies, the battle front will move from natural technological and social spaces to cognitive domains, according to China. Uh, earlier, European speaker also alluded to this. So operation itself has to be considered going forward and the uh, military operations would not only accompany physical destruction, but military operation even start even before that stage, actually in the operations that would accompany physical uh, 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 destruction, uh, you can use a, a very cheap uh, drones uh, operating in swarm. And also uh, there could be a war 
uh, operation conducted by AI enabled autonomous robots and also swarm operation by UAV and also AI would decide the appropriate timing of attack and uh, how to attack would be decided by AI as well. And also sleeper weapons uh, can stay there for many years and not only uh, under the sea, but also on the land, sleeper weapons can be on standby. So furthermore, autonomous uh, cognitive uh, control war can be waged as well. So as was mentioned earlier, the decision-making cycle would be shortened. That is enabled by uh, AI use. So the decision-making on the part of the enemy can be hampered without uh, providing appropriate information, rather wrong information can be deliberately provided to the enemies. This can be done. And uh, China uh, says that this is the important control over intelligence. So who is going to control intelligence? That would dictate the result of uh, wars. And also cognitive domain it cannot be waged only in military operation. Maybe we are going to discuss this issue later on. Japan has an issue with the gray zone uh, operation as well. For example, the physical destruction uh, by a military attack would not be initiated. Uh, rather, uh, in the beginning, uh, we try to paralyze a social function, and for that purpose, AI could be leveraged. Therefore, AI uh, enabled cyber attack and disinformation campaign is some examples in this regard. So in this way, centering around AI, the information informatization warfare, according to China, and also network centric warfare, all these will be combined. Uh, big data management, cloud computing, and also high speed computing technologies will be all combined and integrated. And that would alter the war fighting scenarios in the future. By using AI, new technology can be developed in a shorter, shorter period. So, and how AI will be utilized in the future, and also using AI, the laws, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, laws uh, has a ethical issue as well. So uh, in conjunction with the development of these weapons, how countries come together to decide uh, rules related to the use of such uh, weapons. Thank you. Uh, Mr. O'Hara, thank you for laying out a very comprehensive uh, plan of attack of how things are going. For those of you who just joined us, we've just finished our first round of questions focusing on which technologies really possess potential game changers. Uh, I'm going to sum it up very quickly for everybody before we get into the next round. So for my takeaways, I think everybody's in agreement that this question of emerging breakthrough technologies, it's multiple. Um, it's going to consider a lot of time about scaling them up, working together to developing them. While you do have very expensive systems that require a huge investment in research and development and political and manpower, you also have the option of the cheaper options that we talked about with the drones. Uh, Mr. Wahara, I thought it was great that you referenced the point about, uh, you know, sending false information uh, to soldiers in the theater the way the Russians have been doing about sending, um, you know, text messages to Ukrainian soldiers and then pinpointing their GPS for, for mortar attacks. So as you said, um, I'm not sure I'm going to be sleeping well today after you mentioned sleeper weapons. So suffice to say, we've exited normal. Um, so what we're going to do now is uh, we finished the first round and we brought up a lot of interesting questions. And as you said, Mr. Ohara, we touched on the question of laws. And for all of you not up on your dictionary, law stands for lethal autonomous weapon systems. Um, so obviously with new technologies come new rules and potential new rules of engagement. So with some countries potentially not having the same commitment to human rights compared to others, is it safe to assume, for instance, that their deployment of these technologies or these law systems would be would match their human rights records? So Stella and Alan, we're going to come back to you now on the ethical question. So Stella, what do you make of all of these, the ethical implications of the new technologies? Or do you think in your opinion, there should be some technologies that should be prohibited the way some chemical weapons are prohibited? 
Thanks for raising that question, um, Roger, because that's one that's uh, very dear to me. And I think that's also very important, especially for the Western community of countries that um, that uh, are, you know, are not just an alliance um, based on interest, but also on shared values. And um, so generally, I would say that um, obviously not every single technology um, or all aspects of it trigger ethical questions or, or like cause a moral dilemma. But I think one of the main concerns by nations and international actors refers to lethal autonomous weapon systems and also the question of retained political and generally human control over their use and their actions reactions. And I think, um, first of all, there's a moral dilemma that applies that you already hinted towards. That is the problem that there are competitors and adversaries that are willing to accept those risks that include also um, uh, causing harm. And, Basically, states are left with a choice. Either you develop these technologies and you risk um, inflicting harm as well, or um, you don't, and then you risk being vulnerable and having a disadvantage. So I think for state actors who are bound um, by the social contract to see this to the security of their citizens, um, allowing such vulnerabilities also, of course, represents um, a moral failure. So this is really like a bit of a catch-22 um, scenario. Um, I think... Um, that does not mean, of course, that just by, um, you know, that states are permitted to risk harm um, and violate international norms, that they simply then do that because adversaries do that. So this is really the, the key issue. And we've seen that there's really only one agreement worldwide that right now might catch the use of lethal autonomous weapons or apply to it, which is the UN Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, the CCW, and some countries are signatories to that. Um, and along with the Human Rights Council, uh, of the United Nations, those two have been involved in the debate on these weapon systems and have uh, said that they need to be most likely be banned before, um, you know, before they develop further and can cause more harm. And I think the furthest step we got so far was that some of the countries in 2018 uh, that are members of the CCW have agreed on um, possible guiding principles. Um, so generally, of course, these autonomous weapon systems are already in use today, um, as for example, in missile defense. But I think the question in the future will be what happens if more precise sensors get integrated and also that more mathematical processes like through AI um, are being involved. And I think that um, that applies to, to civilian questions, like for example, the autonomous car driving around, but of course also to target cycles. So when you actually use these kind of weapons um, with very short direction times, how can you even ensure any kind of human control or legal oversight? Um, because eventually in our law systems, as we have them now, the human is the only one that's a subject to law and, and no one else. And this is where I would like to keep it for the moment, just to give an overview of like what legal regimes we have and where we definitely need to work on internationally. Uh, Stella, thanks for outlining that. It goes without saying that it's a work in progress. And obviously, you don't want this to be a race to the bottom where the failure of some countries or NATO members not to develop those company, uh, those uh, those technologies and lose the strategic uh, ability to dictate the outcome is quite a worrisome. But obviously, with some countries prioritizing that and it's this economies of scale about them working, it works in their advantage. Um, Anna, any quick responses to this? Um, or how do you see ethics focusing in with these new technologies moving forward? Yeah, so I think there are there is some some common ground across, uh, you know, like all the signatories um, horizontally, and that in general there's consensus that humans must play a role in the use of force and the use of autonomous weapon systems. Um, I think there's a particular concern about capabilities that make life and death decisions because if you're regulating autonomy or the you know the autonomous ability to exercise force like you you kind of have some options in terms of do you regulate the technology but then that exposes you because you know technology evolves so quickly that regulating the name of the technology could easily become outdated within a number of years um, especially because you know, digital technologies evolve like much much quicker than hardware like all the software that enables these capabilities do you regulate how autonomous it is um, so you know like is it is it able to make complex decisions but again you know that might evolve quite quickly as well um, and I think there's some interesting discussions about instead regulating the lethality of uh, of capabilities um, and really you know distinguishing the point where a machine is able to make a life and death decision because you know as Dr. Adorf mentioned 
it's quite difficult to be able to make a hundred individual decisions when you're working at the speeds that war fighters are, are working on in battlefields, you know, 2021, let alone 2040. Um, and, you know, like maybe one compromise that uh, colleagues in the US Air Force uh, Intelligence Accelerator at MIT have been discussing are looking at, you know, maybe AI should perform more of the functions in terms of identifying targets and distinguishing potential targets while humans make high level decisions on the kinds of calls that um, those capabilities are able to make and then allow the machine to make that decision at, at the moment in time. I and mean, thanks for all the feedback on it. Um, I think it's a great point that you're dropping in there that in terms of development, that the software is always moving so much faster than the development of the hardware. There's less resources that need to go into developing as it's just code and, and wires. Um, moving now back to Asia uh, with Colonel Shinsu and Mr. Wada, before getting to our next question, do you yourselves have any response to the ethical quagmires that we face ourselves in when it comes to you know what we make of these new technologies and how they're deployed in future operations? Okay, thank you, Roger. Thank you for that question. Appreciate it. Yes, and I do appreciate this point that you raised, as, as was mentioned by Stella and Anna in their respective comments. So the ethical side, this, I believe, is a cat and mouse game, cat and mouse game isn't it? For any weapon system, for any technology, when we look back, similar discussions have taken place in the past. But then in the recent years, especially what we're faced with, what, what we're faced with, what is the problem? The pace of change is so fast. That has been the challenge, which means that we cannot keep up. And international consensus building is not able to keep a pace. So technology has gone ahead. That capability, so people who have the technology and capability first will get in the first mover advantage. And that advantage is more is is really much faster than compared against the past. So as a practitioner, those of us in the Air Self Defense Force last year. We created a space operation unit. Like the uh, like Western counterparts, we want to commit to space domain. So that is why I set up this unit. But then having said that, there is no international law with regard to space. It is, it is still undeveloped. This uh, space, which is being discussed so uh, heatedly, it is not yet covered by any law. What about cyber? What about the ETT? And what about decision making based on AI? Who is going to ensure that responsibility in these domains? What about lasers? What about fatalities as a result of laser? What about the ethical? What about the moralistic moral, uh, perspective? All these points are not yet fully determined right now. And the same applies to laws as well. So when we think about this, as was mentioned by Mr. Ohara earlier, what should we do? We're talking about cross domain, multi domain, and all domain. We're talking about all these different domains right now. And we see, should, should, you should, we, we see this was unified theater and one domain. We have to process a lot of information. This is above and beyond our human capacity, which requires big data and AI to handle such decision making process. Then there are elements that AI will make decisions where humans cannot in that case. So, response by the decision by the AI when it comes to key. Is it really good to have AI decisions to kill people? In the context of laws, it's only one specific element, but in terms of the overall decision-making mechanism, this represents a very significant issue. And this is something that we practitioners really should give thought to. We need to build global consensus on this matter. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Shinsu, thank you for your declarations on it. Um, and I think, like you said, the idea of one actor making the first move sets a dangerous precedent, which might make the other one have to follow through with it, even on the lethality. Um, before we get into you, Mr. Ohara, I just want to remind all of our friends in Europe and in Asia, uh, feel free to drop a question in the chat bar or on Facebook. Um, I'm sure our speakers would love to hear from you. So the floor is yours, Mr. Ohara. Hi. Thank you. The question you have just raised, the need for 
that has been uh, indicated by other speakers, and I agree with them. However, whether or not we'll be able to have some effective result, effective consensus, I don't know. I am not optimistic about whether or not we'll be able to reach effective consensus. In discussing such a, a matter, the militarily advantageous country uh, would go for new technologies, and the, they would like to involved in rulemaking of new technologies and uh, they can easily agree upon the rules. However, those who think they are inferior militarily uh, would think that they would have an opportunity by using new technologies in order to overturn the position. Then in that case, I think it's difficult to reach consensus among different countries. So that human beings will make a final decision, as is often said, then what the attack related decision are you talking about what level of a decision uh, it is quite difficult to reach uh, consensus if uh, among uh, mature military forces at uh, each trigger point uh, maybe human decision needs to be made and on this matter consensus could be easier to be reached however less mature countries then more rough level at the higher level if they find an enemy they would want to attack that kind of decision should be done by human beings however more smaller detail decision can be made by ai maybe that is a view by less mature countries and according to other european speakers it was said that uh, high level decision should be done by human beings so I think it's easier to reach such a consensus. However, when you say high level, uh, how high is it when it comes to a specific and concrete discussion regarding the level of discussion, it's very difficult to reach consensus. And it takes time to discuss such an issue. That means that we'll be uh, lagging behind the technology development. And while we wait, inexpensive drones would identify human beings and start attacking us. That is already being done in battlefield. So AI-centered autonomous weapons, the presence of such weapons will be potentially high in the future. And uh, in order to confuse society using AI, that kind of operation is something we have to be ready and we have to be uh, concerned about. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ohara, thank you so much. Um, I really like this idea of introducing the, the concept to everybody in the webinar today about sort of what is the level of comfort we all have as humanity about decision making. It's already controversial enough um, if you have drones operating and firing missiles, hell, uh, you know, targeting without much human interaction. But it's an entirely different dynamic to think about what it would be like if there was, uh, you know, a nuclear response based on AI, uh, something wrong with the radar. So I think that's something I'd like to continue maybe to to touch on in the con in the uh, in the conclusion and uh, and the last remarks about it. Um, now, obviously, we're all allies, we're all democracies in one way or another. Um, we're going to go back to our uh, our female panelists. So Stella and Anna, obviously, we've covered a huge amount of ground in a short in a short amount of time, different technologies, hardware, software. It's hard enough internally for a nation to stay up to date with it. So I'm going to open up the floor to you. How do allies, whether they're in NATO or you know the way the Quad is set up, how do we work and foster interoperability between theater operations, and is it maybe even between industries and private uh, private stakeholders? I just go ahead. <laughs> I just assumed it's it's my turn. Sorry, Anna. Please jump in if uh, you want to say something first. Um, yeah, that's a very very difficult question, obviously, because we're still in this in this. Um, in this phase of understanding what technologies are coming our way, what they mean, um, what they, which impact they might have. So I think in order to grasp that better, so when it comes to interoperability or generally capability gaps, I think the most important thing is to communicate with each other. So um, based on, on, on some of the, um, the assumptions and, and recommendations that have been made by the, uh, the Science and Technology Organization, our advisory group also had a look at like what, what kind of things we need to achieve in order to to get some kind of consensus maybe in the future and that is um 
some of the areas are obviously committing the right financial and uh, human resources. That's something that Colonel Shitsu also already um, hinted to, that is, it's really a financial question in the end as well. Um, then develop our capabilities to scan the horizon effectively, to like know what is coming our way. And I think uh, Anna and, and Rand and, and think tanks like that are extremely critical for that to really understand what, what is going on in the wider, in the wider space. Um, then for us, it's also developing internal um, competence in, in innovative technology and innovation. So have the experts there in, in posts that are able to make a difference. Um, and of course, also participate in kind of like what we call triple helix ecosystems, which means to leverage like really the brightest minds across governments, states, um, think tanks, uh, industry and academia. Um, I think that is the, the critical thing to really understand what is coming our way. And then eventually, of course, also finding a seeking an active role also for the alliance in the discussion on international policy. Um, that, like, that would be basically key for maintaining and defining what means peace and security for us. Um, and I think NATO can there be a recognizable thought leader, really, um, amongst technology literate um, and engaging civil civilians as well in our populations. Um, so, yeah, these are basically the main uh, main, main innovative um, suggestions um, that we can see where, where NATO is heading towards. So really a lot of it is understanding the problem and then understanding how to tackle that problem with the right people in place and with the right partners and allies in place. Uh, thanks so much, Stella. I mean, Anna, speaking of, uh, you know, proper partners and developing internal competence, what do you make of how, you know, alliances or, you know, security partnerships can make the best out of interoperability when software and hardware are changing so fast and there's different, you know, standardization agreements, for instance, just in NATO? So completely agree. I think in, in the first instance, it's important to have a common understanding of, you know, the technology its definitions, the barriers, the limitations, the vulnerabilities. Um, and then perhaps the next step is, you know, wargaming, modeling, stimulation, experimentation to socialize, stress test, refine uh, cooperation, especially across domains and across allies. Um, maybe also sharing information on good practice or lessons learned after, you know, different countries um, uh, actually like roll out these capabilities, um, which, you know, creates like a good sandbox uh, and wealth of information that, that could be leveraged to inform future operations. Um, there might be, you know, some like tough questions about what kind of investments will be necessary for the ambitious transformation programs that will enable, you know, true interoperability, especially in, in you know, multi-domain operations. Um, and, you know, for the US, um, I think there might be questions about uh, domestic inter-service rivalries in addition to the multilateral component. And then for larger European nations, there might be the dilemma of whether, you know, do you buy into this US-led architecture and system of systems, which has implications on freedom of action, data sharing and procurement choices. But um, as we know from our research on strategic autonomy uh, for the European institutions, you know, do, the, do you shoulder the costs of sovereign or multinational alternatives. Um, what could help, though, is perhaps, you know, things like technical standards, um, and also kind of increasing the confidence in your suppliers through, you know, vetting, uh, vetting systems, accreditation systems, uh, education, training, and exercise across, you know, not just, not just the armed forces, not just the ministries of defense, but also defense industry, because, these defense industrial supply chains and, and the accessibility, the reliability of these vast supply chains that in also interconnect with the commercial industry um, and, you know, could create cyber vulnerabilities for defense capabilities um, will be crucial. So for example, uh, in, in one report that 
we that RAND colleagues in the US recently did uh, called Preparing Japan's Multi-Domain Defense Force for the Future Battle Space Using Emerging Technologies. One interesting point that they brought up is how um, for Japan, if, if you know, strengthening cyber and electronic warfare capabilities is a priority um, to ensure interoperability with US forces, uh, the US will be more likely to uh, I guess, integrate its networks in, in a smoother way if it has confidence that doing so will not open uh, backdoor infiltration to its own network. So cybersecurity considerations um, will probably, as, as we talk about you know, increasing digitalization, hyper-connectivity across all of these capabilities, um, will probably be one of the prime, prime concerns for interoperability. Uh, Anna, thanks for that. I mean, I, I definitely want to stay on the theme of interoperability and make sure that our speakers uh, in Asia can get something to say. Really quickly, um, I completely endorse the idea of sort of practice makes perfect when it comes to doing more simulation and war gaming. Um, I know, Stella, in some of our conversations we've had with the NATO 2030 private sector dialogues, this has been prioritized. Um, great point, Anna, about sort of vetting suppliers. We saw what happened uh, with the cyber, but when you outsource it on different levels, and obviously sort of overcome this issues of the sensitivity of, tra of transfer of technology and sort of growing it organically is a really hard issue uh, that I think NATO allies and other countries are working on. So now Colonel Shinsu and uh, Mr. Ohara, what do you make of the interoperability challenge facing you know, Japan, whether it's in the quad or more generally speaking among uh, democratic alliances? Yes, thank you very much for that. When it comes to interoperability, based as a premise, we need reliant, uh, reliability, we need trust and, and credibility. That is most important for any ally, for any country. That is a well-known fact. And there are two major factors behind this uh, uh, trust and credibility. First is operational aspect, be it exercise or be it actual process, procedures. Also, when it comes to doctrine owned by each military services, and so thought process, we there needs to be a common thread among the actors. And the other element behind the uh, interoperability is the technology aspect. And technology, uh, let me delve further into technology, which is topic for our discussion. So, we need something that can contribute to technological interoperability. For example, common platforms. Japan. The only ally for Japan is the U.S. And when it comes to the interoperability, we have many common 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 elements. Also, we're trying to inter, uh, integrate our protocols between J J U.S. and Japan. So that's the technological aspect in terms of global, um, interoperability. Also, when, when it comes to dual use, it shouldn't be business just governments. We need public and private sector. We need also industry, government, and academia linkage, even domestic, even in the domestic sense. We need interoperability in, in domestically among these three parties. And so we need to cross tasks and pro process. We also need interoperability with other countries. And that should be done at the government level, at the military level, as well as at the private sector level. If I could toot to, 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 to my own horn, Air Self Defense Force, in my capacity, we have created our own office, innovation driving office for emerging technology. So Japan Air, Air Self Defense Force created my office, innovation driving office, because we wanted to incorporate advanced technology as soon as possible in the Air, Air Self Defense Force. We want to make sure that innovative philosophy could be incorporated, incorporated so that we can advance dual use technology. And this, I believe, will contribute to uh, interoperability. So that is something, so that's the interoperability element that we need to consider. That is all, thank you. Uh, Colonel Shinsu, thank you so much for sort of raising the issue of both common threat and common uh, platforms and integrating protocols together. Before ending up uh, on our last round of questions, Mr. Ohara, how do you view the idea of interoperability among allies? And, you know, do you see a major problem to overcome or maybe a solution that we're not thinking about at the moment? Thank you very much. Mutual trust was already referred to, so I would like to talk about operational interoperability more in detail. What is necessary is a, a common operational concept and the information sharing. In the past, 
the uh, target related information was shared and also the uh, own actions were provided to the other party. We would ask the other party to take such and such action. So such a request and orders were exchanged by radio or maybe flag, uh, hand flag. And also uh, but currently uh, we are using a network to exchange such information on a real time basis. So if that's the case, then information sharing in this way would be the basis for the interoperability. So such a system needs to be built for that certain technology is necessary. In Japan, uh, as a country, as the state, such technologies are existent. And also as a democratic country, ethical issue has to be discussed. And uh, we have a, a foundation or ability to discuss uh, ethical issues as well. However, even so, we have unique problems. For example, the, if we are to use a EDT, actually 90% of the potential EDT is in the hands of private sector. And also uh, it is not easy for the Japanese government to apply such technologies to weapons and military equipment. Since I was asked a question, but actually since this is a good opportunity, I want to ask a question to European speakers too. Earlier, the appropriate partner has to be found and we have to partner with good partners. Then how, who is the appropriate partner to work with? We have to identify who is the good partner and what would be the necessary conditions for someone to become a good partner? Do you think Japan would be recognized as an appropriate partner for Europe? As I said earlier, a majority of technologies are in the hands of private sector in Japan and in Europe, not only defense ministries, but also defense industry is involved in order to transform supply chain according to the previous speaker. Now, when it comes to defense industry involving private sector in order to do that, what would be the appropriate framework or platform? What is the available platform uh, now or maybe platform in the making in Europe? That is my question, thank you. Um, Mr. Ohara, thank you so much uh, for the intervention. Um, I'm always one who likes surprises. So Stella or Anna, uh, feel free to handle the question if you want. Um, not under any obligation, no hypersonic missile coming your way. Um, and let me know and then we can get down to the last round of questions because uh, unfortunately we're approaching the last 15 minute mark. And to all of our questions uh, out there, we, we're, we still have a little bit of time in case you want to drop them. I'm just I'm going to take that um, just quickly and as, as a personal assessment. So I know that Japan is already a partner of NATO um, and there are various fields that we, that we cooperate on. Um, my personal assessment is that in the future, as we see now with more allied deployments also in the South China Sea, and you mentioned the British carrier group close to, to Japan at the moment, um, and also other allies being interested in, in keeping um, security there um, in the region alive and not dominated by, by specific actors alone. Um, I think all the developments we've seen with the Quad and the discussions that involve also uh, Western countries as much as the countries of that region, I think the trend will go towards much more cooperation in the future um, because it's not a, probably a, a matter of choice, it's probably a matter of necessity in a way. Um, because as we've seen now at the latest time in, the, in this pandemic is that anything that happens anywhere in the world becomes our, our, our all responsibility and problem. And I think that is something that we, in a globalized world dominated by new technologies, cannot be avoided at any time. So uh, this is something where I see that more cooperation will be key, and that will be across continents. And do you want to take a, a, a quick stab at the question before the last round? I mean, who the appropriate partner is for Japan in European private industry, truly? I mean, I don't know, uh, but I think that there's based on the research that we've done and based on our, our interactions with stakeholders, there certainly is a lot of interest in the Japanese context in terms of adoption of technological innovation and how Europe can learn from Japan. So I don't think that that there will be, you know, like a lack of, of interest at all. There's, for example, I, I recently did a workshop with the UK Defense Science and Technology Laboratory on robotics and autonomous systems. And it was noted how uh, they could see that Japan was, um, 
further ahead in terms of, you know, like public acceptability of having robotics in daily life. And that's kind of like where the needle, uh, the needle is about um, how public acceptability is, is going to move. So, you know, like that client was looking to the Japanese context to see like how might this evolve in the future for us? Would the acceptability of having RAS as part of military capabilities be more in the future if in daily life um, it was more commonplace to see these kinds of robotics and autonomous systems uh, as well. And then, you know, Japan is well renowned for its gaming industry, which, you know, what does that have to do with the military, but all the military simulation and training developments that we're, we're scanning for at the moment have some kind of augmented virtual reality or, you know, like an in, in AI enabled um, uh, intelligence systems that uh, might even involve, you know, human machine integration. Um, and there's a lot of interest in the capabilities of, of Japan's commercial sector in, in this area. Um, so yeah, we continue to track this with great interest and um, yeah, look forward to, to what kind of potential collaborations might be possible um, across the continents in the future. Yeah, thanks. And I mean, I'm just, uh, you know, thank you for laying out the, the potential, you know, areas of cooperation, and obviously bringing attention to Japan's gaming industry and all of the advancement. Um, Stella, I already know I'm going to be able to sleep better tonight after learning about sleeping weapons, after you mentioned that sort of the trend moving forward is cooperation, not out of convenience, out of necessity. So I think everybody watching this should take fact that, I mean, whether it's the pandemic or other threats, we're going to all have to come to work together, whether it's on the private sector phase or government to government. So it was a great Stella, and I'm really appreciative uh, you dropping it. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, we're at that sort of moment of the webinar. We only have 10 minutes left, and I'd like everybody to pull out their crystal balls because it's time for prediction time. Audience, get your popcorn, get your coffee uh, as we hit the big ticket item. So we're going to uh, start again with Stella and Anna before moving over to our speakers in Japan. So Anna and Stella, looking to the future, it's the year 2040. How does technology help militaries achieve mission success and also defend national interests? Uh, looking forward to hearing your predictions. So um, as a historian by training, I must say that I often have a dystopian future, uh, future vision, so to say, and I kind of agree with um, Boris Johnson, who a couple of years ago made this comments at the UN General Assembly that the future will be quite dire in, in terms of uh, how technologies will affect our life. I mean, there are obviously going to be very positive and negative aspects of each of these technologies. And um, yes, they will enable militaries to cooperate better, to connect themselves within better. Um, yes, big data, AI and so on will, will work and they will make um, militaries more efficient, but they will make them more efficient for probably everyone because that, that kind of race for these technologies has already started and it will continue. So I think by the year 2040, um, I could see that um, maybe we had the situation where we were about to lose control, that some technologies went off, um, off the handle and um, then uh, we basically realized that if we continue like that on that path, we will not be able to to continue and that might lead to the entire banning of weapon systems similar to what we've seen with um, gas being banned after the use in the first second world uh, in the first world war um, or the banning um, or arms control at least concerning the use of nuclear weapons so i think there are specific areas there that i see and in general you know there's a lot of discussion about like this post-humanist or transhumanist kind of future scenario where humans are um side by side with machines, they're teaming up or they're being replaced. Um, I really hope that the replacement will not uh, take place. And I think there's certain measures we have to take for that. Um, so the first one that we really have to keep in mind, and I think that's something for 2040 to prepare for now, and that is um, can and should machines be programmed with a moral conscience that they take moral decisions? No, they should not. I think this is where we should uh, step in and stop. And it's the same about enhancements of humans, like of the soldier and so on to be more efficient. There are certain limits and that uh, the limit is human dignity and how we define it. And as long as we do that, and as long as both nations, but also individuals are called to their responsibility to, to set up very strict rule sets uh, that are agreed on internationally and that are defended by nations and organizations, I think then it will be very hard, but it is possible. And I think by 2040, we might see that happen and that we can use technologies in a military context without um, risking destroying the entirety of the human race. 
Uh, Stella, I love the comparison of sort of the outlawing of gas after the First World Wars, uh, and then now sort of that our limit now has to be human dignity when it comes to human human machine teaming or platforms working together. It's often overlooked that, uh, you know, this is a, it's a moral compunction of everybody to want to keep it. And it's not about taking over somebody else, but just that we're all humans at the end of the day, regardless of where we're born. Uh, and over 2040, you might still be at RAND, I might still be at GlobeSec. You know, where is technology heading with military technology? Where is uh, technology heading with military operations? So I think in terms of uh, conventional warfare, as I mentioned earlier, our stakeholders are most interested in enabling long range and first strike capabilities. So long range accurate targeting um, capabilities that can hit their targets very precisely and achieve effects without wasting weapons or and minimizing the risk of collateral damage. But perhaps like counterintuitively, because I think there's you know a, a, a tendency to focus, especially when we work on defense industrial base studies in RAND, let's say for the European Defense Agency, we, for example, did a, a study on anti-tank weapons. Um, and, you know, we do a lot of workshops that are, are participated in by all, all the member states, uh, all the EDA participating member states. And there's a lot of interest in, you know, like, what's the new sexy weapon? What's the new, um, the most novel uh next generation anti-tank weapon that can go the furthest, can withstand the worst temperature, the highest or the lowest temperatures. Um, but kind of, I guess as a, as a curveball, actually, you know, a lot of uh, our stakeholder engagement is saying that actually what will win, you know, Battlefield 2040 is things like, you know, can you disrupt the network security of the other side? Um, since they're going to be so central to command and control um, and every side is going to have unmanned and manned systems for you know, C4 ISR, um, are you able to strengthen your cyber and electronic warfare defenses um, to uh, you know, achieve operational advantage or ensure interoperability with your allies? Um, also things like deception. So we're looking at a lot of, uh, you know, like aero structures that have advanced camouflage, um, you know, things like almost like, you know, sci-fi invisibility cloaks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not uncommon anymore actually, but um, things that uh, can inject false information in the information streams of adversary networks or yeah. that can confuse uh, decision-making and create the critical delays that would create the strategic advantage for you know, your human operator or your intelligent machine to uh, strike first, um, but also things like resilience, enhancing the resilience of your critical national infrastructure. And that's, that's not Anna. just... Yeah, sorry, sorry to cut you off. We're really running out of time. Uh, I think, as you said, just to sum it up, um, there are a ton of trendy and sexy weapons, what's hot on the market right now. So, I mean, like you said, 2040, the new collection coming out from whatever company will be quite something. Uh, gentlemen in Japan, I'm sorry, we're here. Um, your closing remarks, it's 2040. How do you see technologies on military operation and, uh, and planning? Uh, Colonel Shinzu, I think you're muted. Or Mr. Wahara. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. So it's so 2040. If I'm if I'm there, I wish I, if I knew I'd answer. I wish I could ask Roger. That's, that's a joke. But based, just two things, if I could talk about just two things in relation to 2040, which has not yet been raised. So the game changers that we're talking about in 2040, game changers, will, they will no longer be game changers. It will be a foundation technology. It will be basic technology. It will no longer be a game changer in 2040. So if that is the case, in the meantime, what must be done? What, for one thing, we have to identify technology which we must have as a must. We must make sure that we get this technology so they can become foundation technology. So that I believe is a technological aspect that we have to bear in mind when we in the run up to 2040. Now, having said that, what about the next generation game changer? What about the next game changer? What about new 
technologies that could translate into tactical technology. We need to continue to identify those emerging technologies, but that's going to be very challenging. Finding something new is going to be challenging. We tend to, I think we're trying to come up with new emerging technologies by multiplying new technology, but if we adopt the innovative technology, maybe we can combine something new and something old and create something totally different. Or we could team up two different old technologies and create and come up with new ways to utilize that and to, to operate that. So I think this should be part of our scope of our work. So when we talk about new game changers, we have to uh, embody all these possibilities going forward. So that's the scenario for the 2040. That's what we should do in 2040. Now, having said all this, naturally, it's not going to be like a movie. It's not, it's not going to be like AI a laser you know a field world it's not that that i think we have to go beyond this imagination and also one more point if i could just one last point, one point. cognitive technology we have to consider the cognitive as was mentioned by anna earlier disinformation we have to address that is it fake is it true we have to identify the legitimacy of the information information is going to be the key so the given information is it true or not especially we have deep fake based on new technologies. It's very difficult to uh, discern these technology, uh, these information. So we have, so in the world of technical theaters, what is what is right has to be decided at the, uh, one moment. And that is going to be the warfare in 2040. That is all. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Shinzi, thank you so much for your, your optimistic outlook and your good sense of humor. I really liked your idea of sort of the idea of bringing together antiquated or old technologies and coming up with something hybrid. I mean, not only is it an innovative idea, but most importantly, it's also sustainable given, you know, all of the elements like rare earth elements uh, and some of the critical technologies out there. So something to go back to the people at DARPA about. Uh, Mr. Ohara, you were the last person to speak on the first question, and now you are the last person uh, to give your closing remarks here. So the floor is yours, sir, before uh, we sign off and wish everybody else a great uh, Thursday. Hi. Thank you very much. In 2040, what will be there? I think there are two aspects to it. One is when it comes to war fighting, fundamentally, there will be no change to warfare. Uh, we have to effectively identify and destroy the enemy's weapons while minimizing our own damages. The European speaker also said earlier the uh, long range precision uh, destruction uh, capability is to be pursued and new technology will be used for that purpose. If the range becomes longer and longer in order to share information, network will be critically important. Another aspect, we are going to have a, a broader uh, scope of uh, battlefield. Therefore, uh, cognition uh, will be uh, important as well. And also that could be a social domain as well. Without network, uh, we cannot uh, uh, survive and economic activity depends on our network as well. 3G, 4G, in those days, the service vector was uh, uh, from real world to virtual world. However, in the age of 5G, from virtual world to real world, so service vector is changing from virtual world to real world, we can move things using IoT, Internet of Things, and such a technology will penetrate into our day-to-day -day life and economic activities. In terms of military action, such a trend will be uh, applicable as well network centric activities and behaviors uh, will be conducted and network will be targeted. Military target could be network as well. That is inevitable. So uh, the technology uh, have to be developed and also private sector is ahead of uh, government sector in developing technologies and such private sector owned technology could be applied to military purposes. Uh, therefore, the use of military technology has to be deeply considered, not only one country, but also the countries with constraints like Japan, uh, which is not a big country, we have a constitutional constraint, and therefore SDF cannot use our weapons, for instance. So uh, among countries with such constraints could work together going forward, such collaboration would be necessary. So against this backdrop, I think today's discussion was very timely and very uh, helpful. We were able to take a first important step uh, in order to promote cooperation between Europe and uh, Japan going forward. 
we would like to discuss further uh, the specific areas of cooperation between Japan and Europe going forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wahara, thank you for the closing remarks. Um, I'm going to take a couple of quick shot at just sort of summing everything up. So just to begin with, um, to all of our speakers, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Uh, I found it exceptionally enlightening, and I'm sure everybody else did. Just very quickly, um, I think, as you said, the game is changing, um, and despite the game changing, some things still remain the same when it comes to the fundamentals of war fighting, the destruction of enemies, Connectivity will continue to grow and only play a larger role in war fighting. Um, but at the same time, as this grows and we start to give more responsibility and decision making to AI systems and algorithms, I think we should also be cognitive, uh, no pun intended, of making sure that this moral limit is kept in check. Um, no matter the adversaries, it is the trend that we're going to have to continue to work together to solve problems. There's not one problem out there that only one nation can solve as COVID has. And, you know, whether it's a pandemic or another security challenge, we're probably just at the start of something as opposed to the end. So definitely a lot of food of thought to consider. Uh, Mr. Wahara, you said this was the first step in cooperation, and I hope we're going to have the opportunity throughout the course of the year, GlobeSec and Sasakawa Peace Foundation, to continue to revisit these subjects. Um, everybody, if you can't wait, uh, we're going to get started on these policy takeaways as soon as possible. That will sort of sum up all of the main takeaways. The most important is thank you to the viewers who came and watched uh, in the evening over in Japan. It's an early morning here in Europe, so I, I hope it was due. And most importantly, thank you so much to our outstanding team of translators uh, who made this all function. I, on our end, it worked very well. So from here in Bratislava, Dobry Dien, uh, and to all of our friends in Japan, sayonara. So thank you very much. Stay in touch, and everybody be healthy. Goodbye.